turning our attention now to another trial we are following on Court TV. New Jersey versus Michael Barazone. Prosecutors claim that Michael Barazone shot an up-and-coming writer and his former tenant, Lauren Kanarek, and attempted to also shoot her fiancé, Robert Goodwin. This happened back in August of 2019. Barazone's defense team claimed that their client was mentally tortured by Lauren and Robert and that this led to his deteriorating mental state. In court, the defense is trying to paint a picture of abuse the defendant suffered at the hands of Lauren and Robert. From threatening social media posts, to attacks from their dog, and even reporting construction dangers to the city that could have led to a $5,000 daily fine. During this incident, that dog was outside at some point, correct? Correct. <laughs> And will you agree with me that he attacked Michael Barrison? Yes. He was biting him. His teeth were, were grabbing his body, correct? Yes, her teeth were nipping at him and biting at him, correct. Did you see that dog? biting at his groin area next to his genitals. No, I did not see that. Where did you see this dog biting Michael Barrison? I mostly saw her biting him and Robert in, I guess, just random places while barking. I, I was really losing a lot of blood, so I... It's not clear as to where exactly she was, you know, nipping around. Was it your intention to scare Michael Barrison? Um, maybe at, at, the po at a point. What point was that? I don't recall after being bullied and tortured for weeks and days. Isn't it a fact that on that day, July 25th, 2019, mm -hmm. that you, your boyfriend, and your dad were aware of the fact that Michael Barrison was scared. It seems in this text message because it says Michael is scared. So who wrote that text message? I believe I wrote it. When it when you not... say I believe yes. I wrote it. Yes. Is there any question in your mind? that the records of your cell phone indicate exactly what you wrote on that day. No, I was just confused because I wasn't sure if this number was me sending the text or the other person sending the text that we were talking in conversation. Okay, so irrespective yes. of who said it, all three of you knew that Michael Barrison was scared on that day, correct? I wrote the words, yes, Michael is scared, correct. Did you see any changes in Michael's behavior in the days leading up to the incident? Yes. What did you see? He was falling apart. He came, became completely distraught. Um, just completely distraught, not himself, worried, very, just, I would describe it as terrified of of living in his own home. I mean, he was terrified. Did you develop uh, any concerns for yourself when you saw Michael in this condition? Yes. Did that add to the concerns you had for your safety, the safety of your daughter, and the safety of your animals? Yes. And who, which persons were the source of your concern? Lauren Kanderak and Robert Goodwin. Did you have a chance to observe whether or not Michael Barrison uh, interacted with Lauren Kanarak or Robert Goodwin alone in those days leading up to the incident? He never wanted to be alone with them. In, in fact, it was he went out of his way to not be alone with them. Um, 
He was terrified of them. We, I was terrified of them. Did you make any observations of Michael at the time you encountered him while you were sitting in the arena on the morning of the incident in his chair? Yes, he walked out. What were your observations? I'm sorry. It's okay. A question is better than we get a question and an answer, you know? Sure. Okay. Um, he was totally absent, catatonic. He didn't even know I was sitting there. Still with us, former federal prosecutor Nima Romani, and now would like to welcome a special guest here with us for this segment from Los Angeles, California, forensic psychiatrist Carol Lieberman. All right, let's talk about this. First, I want to say to both of you, we just noticed that witness say that she observed the defendant was falling apart, completely distraught, worried terrified of them, meaning the victim in the case and her fiance. Um, so I wanna take that in conjunction with some other information that this uh, great team here at Court TV has put together to show everyone. And this is where the mental abuse aspect comes in. Here are some of the things that this defense claims. Number one, that they reported code violations about construction on the defendant's property that the fiance of the victim, Goodwin, actually did himself. Lauren Kanarek also posted threatening social media posts about him. They allegedly had their dog attack him, and Barazone also alleges that they beat him. And so with these things in mind, let me start with you, Carol, if I could please. Is this enough to believe that that's the kind of abuse that caused or resulted in a mental breakdown or temporary insanity? Well, you know, the point is that it was over a period of time. And, um, you know, it's so interesting because we haven't really heard yet, at least I'm not aware of anything, um, that the couple, that his trainee and her boyfriend said that he did to them that would warrant all of the things that they did to him. And it really seems extremely personal, like perhaps Lauren either was romantically, you know, had a crush on him and the kind of teacher student sort of crush, or there was a statement made, a sort of a throwaway statement that said, um, he, uh, his attorney, the defense attorney asked, you know, did your uh, dislike of him or these problems start when he didn't want to train you anymore, when you were not being trained anymore by Michael Barazone. Of course, she denied it. But, you know, that I think is, a, is, if not the key, a key to why she was so, her ego was hurt and her dreams perhaps of being an, an Olympic equestrian herself were dashed. You know, it was, it's some kind of major um, psychological hurt, you know, or, or anger or rejection that she felt. And Nima, what do you think about the legal defense that they're putting forward as a result of that? They're saying basically the abuse caused him to really have a mental breakdown, the temporary insanity, and that he feared for his life because of their behaviors, their abuse, and was defending himself. You know, fascinating discussion by Carol. Uh, yeah, so fascinating discussion by Carol. You know, on the legal side, Ashley, you know, when you're talking about lethal self-defense, right, you need to be in substantial fear of death or real serious bodily injury. And for Barrison to shoot Lauren twice in the chest, I mean, it's unbelievable that she's still alive. I don't think we're there in terms of meeting that high hurdle, that burden that the defense has. The burden's on them. That being said, we've been doing this a long time, Ashley, and whether it's uh, Kyle Rittenhouse or Reeves there in Florida who was attacked with popcorn and a cell phone, you never know what a jury's going to do when it comes to self-defense. And I think the defense is doing a good job with the evidence that they have. They're really highlighting the 911 calls, Barrison calling law enforcement many times about these tenants, uh, the cryptic but potentially threatening social media posts by Lauren talking about chess pieces and so forth. And the day of, of course, at least the allegation is that Barrison was attacked by both Lauren Rob and their dog. So we'll see if a jury buys it. And Nima, I appreciate that you pointed out that this is an affirmative defense. So the defendant has to prove it was self-defense, but a lower burden by preponderance of the evidence. So Carol, talk to us about a, a person in general suffering from a mental disease and therefore did not know that what they did was wrong. Is that, how hard or easy is that to prove and for a jury to believe? 
Um, well, I think it, each case is different, but you know, I think certainly what speaks to uh, or supports this is some of the reports, like what we just heard the witness talk about, the um, woman who worked on the the uh, stable at the at the stable, and also the report of the. Um, Police officer Hensler, uh, he he said that um, the defendant said to him, "Is this real? Do I need to wake up?" I mean, that's that speaks of dissociation. You know, um, he, it, it it goes along with the insanity defense that at the time of the crime, the alleged crime, he didn't know what he was doing or he didn't know that it was wrong, and that is not really, in my opinion, in contradiction with. Um, the fact that uh, that it was self-defense, because even crazy people know how to defend themselves. It's just an automatic kind of reflex. Wow, what great insight, Carol. I so appreciate your coming on with us today because this is a unique case, the self-defense and mental disease or defect. I thank you for your time. Nima, you're going to stay with us.